Welcome to another edition of Anglican on Script of the Saturday edition. This is episode 376. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm Alan Haley, and today is March 3rd, 2018. Via the magic of Skype, it's an app, you got to get it. I have Alan <laughs> Haley on, and we're going to talk a little bit about an agreement between some churches uh, that had left, tried to leave the Episcopal Church of uh, in the Diocese of Pittsburgh, and... Uh, have come to an agreement with the diocese that doesn't involve lawsuits, money, uh, and years and years of uh, sitting in litigation. And I thought I'd ask Alan about it because you're our on-site guru of all things legal. Uh, I sent you a copy. I thought maybe we could summarize the agreement uh, before we uh, get started. Um, what are the good parts of this agreement? Okay, well, first of all, the good part of the agreement is it means an end to any further threat of litigation and having to waste money in the courts on both sides. Um, that's a significant achievement, believe me, in this current world. And uh, it's a, an agreement between as a, the, the Episcopal Diocese of Pittsburgh and the parishes, about seven or eight of them that uh, had left. It's not all the dioceses or parishes that had left with Bishop Duncan, but it's the number of them that remained that had uh, threats of lawsuit against their properties. And they engaged in a lengthy mediation process in, involving two professional mediators um, that finally resulted in the hammering out of this agreement. And it basically resolves all the property claims of the parties by recognizing that the parishes are the legal title holders to their properties the way they've always been. The deeds are in their names and it's never changed. But it also recognizes the Episcopal Church has a trust in those properties by virtue of the Dennis Canon. And so therefore you have the anomaly, which the Dennis Canon itself frankly creates. Uh, it creates a, a trust in favor of the National Church by the National Church making the trust. But it leaves as trustee the individual parish and their vestries. Uh, so <laughs> the parish remains in control of the property. Um, but here they have to recognize that the Episcopal Church has a trust interest. So they divide the properties into two kinds. One are the historic properties that are, the church parishes have always um, kept and owned. And then there's subsequently acquired property, which is from any gift or bequest coming after 2008, when all this litigation started. Um, and those that's in, not subject to any trust interest. That is, it belongs to the parish that that property came to. Or that they subsequently acquired. So uh, what we're talking about is the trust on the historical properties. Those have to be maintained. They, they agree not to alienate the properties, sell them without getting permission uh, permission of the bishop of the Episcopal Diocese. And they agreed basically to pay rent uh, on the properties in perpetuities in the way of a stipend of, I think, for the first seven years or so, it's uh, three and a quarter percent of their operating revenues. And after that, it drops down to 1.75%. But it goes on and on. That's their payment to the diocese for the privilege of being allowed to use their properties. It goes on and on, but it doesn't look like the Episcopal Church is going to be making money on this. Uh, well, no. It's eight parishes maybe paying a total of 100 grand a year to the diocese and yeah. budget, which is not inconsiderable in total. For individually, for the parishes, maybe it wouldn't um, be too much of a burden on any one of them. And that's probably what facilitated the agreement being made. It's interesting in this agreement when they, you know, when we look look in terms of the Dennis Canon, this explains in full the paradox that is the Dennis Canon. Yes, uh, it just goes round and round, and nobody can win with this this canon. No, the courts in Pennsylvania have consistently, since the very beginning, screwed up the Dennis Canon. And this agreement reflects the confused state of the law in the state of Pennsylvania on that. Um, from the very beginning in the case of St. James the Less versus the Diocese of Pennsylvania, that went up all the way to the uh, Supreme Court of Pennsylvania, which held that, well, according to the terms of the Dennis Canon, the parish is, even though it's the legal title holder of the property, uh, it's the trustee as well. And so the Episcopal Church just has a beneficial interest. In other words, you have to maintain the property for the benefit of the diocese and the Episcopal Church. But it left the parish in, in saying that they're the ones who actually 
will control and operate the property. Unfortunately, in that case, after a passage of after five years have gone by in litigation, there wasn't any parish left to operate St. James. They had all been driven away, and so that property lapsed. Uh, it went into the hands of a, a caretaker mission status with another parish in Philadelphia, and today it operates not as a church but as a school um, for neighborhood kids. I also so, well. When I look at this agreement, I see tech kind of saying we can't fill the uh, the churches on our own. You know, no, that's the, I think that's an admission of what they're saying here. But these churches are not ones that we have anybody we can put in. Mm -hmm. At the same time, there is a provision in the agreement saying that if there are people who want to have an Episcopal service, they have a right to have the prop service held on that property at a convenient time for them. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I assume the Episcopal diocese will be supplying. Uh, priests in some cases to deal with the uh, the remnant congregations that still want to remain subject to uh, the Episcopal Church. When I read the agreement, I don't see a win-win. I just see uh, a situation where uh, this is the best we can do, and it was not you know, and I agree with that. This is probably the best they can mm -hmm. do. Uh, but I remember just years ago uh, the vestry of the cathedral. Uh, when one of the ACNA uh, vestrymen didn't show up, quick election, and boom, they're they're now a tech cathedral. Um, yeah. Is this really, are, are, is this an agreement that can be held uh, accountable over time? Well, yes, it'll be enforceable. Well, one interesting thing is if the U.S. Supreme Court were to accept the petition for review in the South Carolina case, and decide that the Dennis Cannon does not create a trust in and of its force, then I don't know, could this be revisited or not? But so, so long as the law in Pennsylvania remains what it is now, this will be enforceable in Pennsylvania. And th that's, uh, as I say, it's th the best thing about the agreement is it allows weary people who have been totally spiritually drawn and worn out by the secular litigation with the Episcopal Church forces, now can put their um, swords and shields down and go off and do their, their mission as they want to do it all along. So that's probably the best part about it, and I'm sure the rectors would tell you this, that if you interviewed them, that this is the best thing for their parishes. They, they see this as a means now, finally, to put this all behind them and a way of going on. You can't argue with that. No, you can't. I mean, this is where uh, Bishop Archbishop Duncan was deposed without cause. I, I'm, sure, <laughs> I'm sure you remember that. Oh, I, I wrote many columns about how Bishop Shorey couldn't read the canons. She just ignored the language when it was her, suited her. She voted uh, a resolution or brought forward a resolution to depose Bishop Duncan before he'd been inhibited as the canon required. She didn't. She just brushed that aside and brushed all objections aside to a quorum and ruled that he'd been deposed. So he was out of the church at that point. At that point, then the Anglican Diocese of Pittsburgh or his own diocese had to withdraw from the church in order to re-elect him as their bishop. Yeah, that was so okay. <laughs> it, that was like, you know, it's a, it, it's a recipe for how to destroy a good diocese. You yeah. you get a dissident group that sues the sitting bishop for nonconformity with the national canons and church the way they read them, and that you sue them both in the civil courts and you sue them in the ecclesiastical courts, and one way or the other you bring things down. It's happened again and again in Pittsburgh, it happened in South Carolina, it's happened in uh, Fort Worth, it happened in San Joaquin. Uh, it, it just goes on and on and on when there's a dissident group that is bound and determined to say, no, it's our way or the highway. And uh, that's, of course, the most unchristian uh, sense that you can take of it, but that's the way things end up. So at least at this point, we're back, I hope, on the Christian road. Yeah, well, let's keep uh, uh, the bishop of the ACNA, Jim Hobby, in your prayers, the bishop of uh, the Episcopal uh, Diocese in Pittsburgh in your prayers, uh, the churches in this agreement. I mean, uh, clearly uh, this is new ground and uh, we, we hope they can make it work. And at the end of the day, the most important thing we can do as Christians is to make sure uh, God is glorified in this. Um, if he's okay. not, start over. Uh, right. there's yeah. There's one more point, Kevin, we probably should make one good point about the agreement. If you remember, the early agreements in the Diocese of Pittsburgh forced the parishes, the Anglican parishes, to withdraw yeah. from the Anglican Diocese for a period of five years, and they couldn't affiliate with anyone else at that time. These later agreements are totally, don't have those, so they've given up those 
unconstitutional forcing people to withdraw from an association they want to belong to. So at least we've made progress on that front. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's good and bad to it, but uh, th you know, at the end of the day, uh, we, we pray for the good. Um, we asked questions last time about Texas. If you, if you guys know anything, contact us. Have you been contacted at all about what's going on in Texas? Well, I found out one thing that the, um, there is a justice that's been assigned to do the opinion, uh, as far as I can tell, and he's struggling with it, having a time, because the arguments raised by the parties are so extensive and on all, raising every possible ground you think that he's trying to deal with them all, and it's it's really proving a struggle. So he's just taking his time about it, I guess. It's difficult. So let's pray. Let's pray for him too, because Absolutely. he needs wisdom and guidance in this. <laughs> well, that's you know the, that's the biggest problem here is uh, there's two thoughts. One is uh, we're we're a national church, our canons supersede law. The other right. is law is something that we succeed to. And we understand, you know, neutral uh, principles and uh, all that type of law. And we want to have uh, the United States Constitution govern us. Right. Yeah. But as we've seen time and time again, the secular courts are ill-equipped to deal with church you know, canon law. And that's what St. Paul said long ago. Just keep your Christian disputes out of the courts and settle them between yourselves as Christians. The wisest advice ever given in over 2,500 years. <laughs> um, would have saved a lot of money. Absolutely. <laughs> would, well, I want to put you out of business. There's enough secular business for you, isn't there? <laughs> right. <laughs> I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm Alan Haley. And this has been edition 376 of Anglican Unscripted.